Hi, I'm Jean. You might notice that this presentation is being given in the future. It is a presentation in February at DevNexus in Atlanta, and you are all the first people in the world to see it. As Frank mentioned, I'm a Java champion. I'm an author. I've been a Java developer for 17 years, and I am a FIRST Robotics mentor. FIRST Robotics is a program for middle school and high school students to learn why tech is fun. I'm also the volunteer coordinator for the event, so if you're free the first weekend in April, please go to firstinspires.org and volunteer. This is the book. This physical book is going to be given away to one of you between Chandra and my presentations. You have to stay awake until then. <laughs> this presentation was created by me. What? Uh, am I not on the mic? No, no. Did you stop the recording? I did. I did. Okay. <laughs> I'm good. Sorry. Beep. All right, anyhow, this presentation was made by me with contributions from my co-author Scott Selikoff and my tech editors Janice Del Vecchio and Elena Felder. All the best ideas come from multiple people, and I'm happy to see that is what is in this presentation. All right, let's get started. We're going to be looking today at various surprising behaviors that you might see in Java. This is not a puzzler's talk. These are things that you might actually see on your own job without having to write obscure code to make them happen. The first one is removing in a loop. So we've got some code here um, that removes stuff from a loop. We're, sorry, removes stuff in a loop. Does anyone know what happens if we run this code? Concurrent modification is bad. Yes, I heard someone say concurrent modification, and I heard someone say bad. <laughs> Both of those things are accurate. When you run this code, it blows up because you're not allowed to remove stuff in a loop. That is not surprising. Many of you knew that. What about this code? What do we think happens here? I'm hearing the same thing. And that's why this talk exists, because it does not do the same thing. It outputs alliance, which is probably not what you wanted to happen. You were probably hoping you would get a concurrent modification exception again, so at least you knew something was wrong or that it would delete both red and alliance from the list and you would have an empty list. Unfortunately, that is not what happens. Let's take a look at why. The first thing that happens is we start our list, red alliance. We've got our two elements. Next, we go through the loop. The first time through the loop, current is red, the first element of the loop. We tell the list to remove the element. It says, cool, I will remove red per your request, all is good. I now have a list with one element in it. It checks the size of the list, which is one. It checks how many elements it has seen, which is one. And it declares that it is done. So while this may be logical behavior, it's probably not the behavior you want, which means it's important to be aware in the source code that you might not always get a concurrent modification exception when you're essentially doing just that. By contrast, when we have red alliance, blue alliance, it does that first removal. It says, I'm going to remove red per your request. Thank you. It says the size is three. We saw one. And wait a minute. You're trying to trick me and delete stuff from a list I'm iterating through. You can't do that. Which is much better behavior, because at least it tells us that something is wrong. Thank you. So now we know what happens if we try to remove in a loop. How do we fix this? The easiest way to fix it is use a proper collection where you can modify in a list. One way is the copy on write array list. And since we have the collection guys here, is there a better way of doing it? Sure, you could, uh, well, you just remove with an iterator. You can't remove with an iterator. That was the original problem. Why was it the original problem? Because that gave us the concurrent modification exception? No, but I meant like, um, you should be able to remove. Oh, are you saying to use the, use a, a the proper data iterator. structure and an iterator? Yes. Gotcha. Yes, that would work as well. Or you could use remove if. Remove if would solve this entire problem, but then it wouldn't demonstrate the problem, and that would be cheating. <laughs> well, you asked me if I could solve the problem, right? <laughs> Get what you asked for. Yes, you, you should be using remove if, or in this case, remove all, because it's really trying to remove everything. So you could just do a clear and call it a day. All right, next up we have creating a set. We all know how to create a set in Java.
Um, in Java, in later versions of Java, you can create a set in multiple ways. But we've got our traditional way where we create an, a list and then we pass to the constructor a hash set and it builds a set for us. In some order, it prints all the words in the world, just in world, just like we want it to. It's gotten rid of the duplicate the for me. This is what I expect to happen when I create a set. All is good. What do we think happens here? Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, you have to stick with that, you're right. <laughs> Before Don gets a chance to change his mind about what happens, he does throw an exception. Well, yeah, I didn't see the two of those. It throws in the legal argument exception, which I learned when I was writing a simple example for how to use set.of. I then check the Java doc, and it does say in the Java doc that you can't do that. Um, it takes a var args, but if you're using the var args version, you have to make sure you don't have duplicates, whereas you, if you use the collections version, all is fine. I found this to be surprising, and it was a piece of advice for me that I should not convert from arrays to sets this way because it's dangerous in a surprising way. So again, things you're actually going to encounter as you're writing code, using set.of is hardly an obscure API that we're talking about here. Next up is back collections. Our monkey's learning lots of stuff here. I hope all of you are as well. First up, we have a collection. Remember, we're going to Atlanta, so we've got to go from Atlanta to New York. We've got a map. We get the key set of it, which is the keys in the map, Braves and Mets. We then remove Mets from it, and what do we think that this is going to output? Not a trick. Remember, the first ones are easy. Brave of what? An exception. Huh. We've got a variety of answers. No, this, this isn't a trick. We're creating a new set. It's separate from the original map. It removes something from its copy of the set. The original map hasn't changed. Nothing special to see here. Next up, we have what I think everybody saw in their head, where we don't have a copy of the set. And this one does, in fact, output Braves Atlanta because it's a back collection, and when you change the key set or the entry set, it changes the original map as well. So that's a fairly subtle difference in the code. You have to look to see whether you're working on a copy of the original collection or the original one. So we got to remember that they're back collections, and it changes the original for us. Next up is overloading. Uh, just a quick question. Yes. Is values a back collection as well? I don't think so, but I'm not positive. Okay. Does anyone know? I feel like it's not because the keys aren't in there, but I'm going to find out because I should know that. What was the question? The question is both key set and entry set are back to collections is values. And my answer is I think no, but I'm not 100% sure. The funny thing is Google could reconcile that in all three seconds, but I'm here presenting and not Googling stuff. But if anyone wants to Google it, feel free to shout out the answer when you find out. All right, next up we have our little monkey who's moving on from collections and starting to learn about overloading. Um, we all know how overloading works. Java picks the most appropriate method to run for us. So I've got two overloaded methods here. They're both named check. One of them takes a number. One of them takes an integer. Integer inherits from number. We've got a nice hierarchy going on here. So if I call check with 5, it's going to print out integer. If I call it with 5.0, it's going to print out number because 5.0 will auto box to a double, and that will give us a number. So all good. We also have a method named delegator that takes a number and calls check of number. That exists to make this harder. Now we have our first example. We have an integer. Um, right, we have an integer. We call check of num, and we call delegator of num. We're going to print out two words here. What do people think that is going to get printed? What do we think is going to get printed first? Okay, and what do we think is going to get printed second? That is not what I have. <laughs> uh, so let's talk through what's going on here. The first time it runs, it calls check. 
which is taking an integer and should absolutely print integer. That's interesting. This doesn't look right. Check my paper copy here. Well, we're going to check, skip to the moral of the story because I'm not sure the slide was right. But what's going on here is that when delegator runs, it's being passed a number. So it always calls check of number regardless of whether it's passed an integer or a number. That was something that was fairly surprising because you're thinking about what's getting called in polymorphism. But that's only happening on instances. It's not happening to the parameter because the compiler says, I'm delegator, I have a number, I'm calling this thing that is a number, all is good. Okay. Sorry, I looked it up. Values is a back collection. Values is a back collection. That is good to know. Thank you, Don. Okay. It's great when you learn things during your own presentation. <laughs> and thank you for Googling. <laughs> Next up, our little monkey is going to explore equal equal. Now, we all know how equal equal works, right? What do we use equal equal for? I heard object references and I heard primitives. Both are correct. Now, we've got our example here. We have int that is representing the integer 8, and we're comparing it with equal equal. And we're also comparing it with equals. What do we think prints out here? True and true. True and true, that's right. I can't trick a group like this. <laughs> it does print out true and true. Um, get to why in a moment. What about now? We're comparing 8,000 and 8,000. What does this one print out? False and true. False and true. Right, you all know this one. What's going on here is that the wrapper classes cache small values. If your number is small, you get the same object and equal equal works. You should not do that. That will confuse everyone who is reading your code. Next up is var. Now, I know a lot of you aren't using Java 11 or 10 yet. Raise your hand if you've used var. Okay, and raise your hand if you know what var does. A couple more people. Var is a new bit of syntax in Java where instead of typing in the type of a local variable, you type var and it represents the type. It's still a type. We're not talking about something like Ruby here where you can just change the, the type willy-nilly at runtime. It's still a type. Java is still a ta statically typed language. The difference is that you've saved some real estate on your screen and or made your code hard to read. One of those is a benefit. One of them is not. There are some instances where using var does make your code easier to read, and there's a lot of instances where it makes your code harder to read. Use it sparingly. We're not going to go the easy to read route in this presentation because we're trying to trick you. So first up, we have how var works, but we're going to look at an example that doesn't use var to set the stage, because I know streams are everybody's favorite topic. So we've got two lists here. First one is an empty list created with a var arc. Second one is a list of three, also created with list.of. We're creating a stream of our two lists, which means we have a stream of lists of integers. We're then calling flat map to turn the, that stream back into numbers. So now we have a stream of the numbers 1, 2, and 3. We're then mapping by adding 1. So now we've got 2, 3, and 4, and printing them out. This does, in fact, print out 2, 3, and 4. I'm going to pause for a moment so this can sink in before we make it more complicated. Okay, ready to move on? Next up, we have the same example, except x2 is now a var. What do we think? Do we think this prints out the same thing? It does, in fact, print out the same thing. It prints out 2, 3, and 4, because var represents the static type that it would have been had you typed it by hand. List 1, 2, 3 is a list of integers, so var of x2 is still a list of integers. Just doesn't say it on the screen, but it's still happening behind the scenes. Now we're changing x1 to also be a var. Do we think this one prints out the same thing? <laughs> Love the looks right now. <laughs> Look, this feels like a trap. <laughs> 
It does not print out the same thing. It doesn't compile. Now, this seems not very substantially different from x2, but of course it is. The difference is list.of could be an empty list of anything. And since the compiler doesn't know, it's actually a list of question extends object. I'm sure that's what you would have typed if you were doing this by hand. Since it's no longer a list of integers, we have when we create our stream a list of question extends object and a list of integer. Stream's like, all right, well, I'm going to upgrade everybody to question extends object. Flat map creates a stream of question extends object, which realistically is an object because you can only call this stuff on objects. And then map says you want to add one to a what now? Nah. You really got to be alert to this stuff, which means using var cautiously and appropriately. It also means if you get obscure errors with var, the first thing you should do is type in the real type and hope the error goes away. Because you get a lovely exception when you do it. So yes. if it wasn't the empty list, then you would still be able to get the answer? Correct. And that was why it worked when we did it with x2. Everything was fine there because with x2 we had the original um, type. It was able to figure out what it was, so everything was fine. It was when we started with list.object that we started having problems. I see a question over there. So if you flip the order where the list of one, two, three was first with... No, because you'd be creating a stream of a list of integers and a list of question extends object. You'd have the same problem, it would just be in a different order. Stream.of needs to create a stream of a given type, and it can only do it with the least strict type that you make available to it. Okay. Next up, we have sorting characters. Sorting characters is something you could ordinarily do, or maybe sorting strings, but we're going to go with characters. So we have lions and tigers and bears. Oh my! We have a comparator of natural order, which means we're going to sort our characters ascendingly. This is all good. And then we have a little, our stream that we're going to call stream collect to turn this back into something useful. We're going to call grouping by to put all of the ones that are the same length together. And then for the value, we're going to do the character that is the minimum one. Like, okay, cool. And this works. Um, this gets us two keys because we have two different lengths here. And it gets us an optional with the first character. That's perfectly fine. Okay, again, I'm going to pause as everybody retains this code. Excellent. Okay. Ah, that's what that is. Next up, sorry, we have similar code, except instead of having the comparator as a local variable, we put it inside of the method. This should be exactly the same code. All I did was undo refactoring to extract the variable. Any ideas what happens here? This one's hard. This is another one I stumbled across when I was trying to create a simple example. It doesn't compile. And the reason it doesn't compile is you're doing this complicated collection of boxing and streams and inferring things and generic types, and at some point the compiler just throws up its hands and does that. That is the whole message. I know you can't read the message. It's long, it's complicated, it involves generics, and I looked at it and I thought, but it's okay. Because the solution, again, is adding your own typing, adding a variable or adding a local variable to the lambda, something to give the compiler a clue of what's going on. Conveniently, that's also the approach that you need in order to troubleshoot these things. Okay, well, my stream doesn't do what I want it to. Let me make a smaller stream and see where things blow up. In this case, it was the comparator. You actually get two compiler errors, though. You get the long, scary one. And then you get one about char at int is not available on type object. I don't have an object, I have a char. But Java doesn't know that. Because after the first error, it got so confused that everything that happened after that was just lost. I don't know what to do, you have an object because I can't make any assumptions for you. Whereas in the first example, I had a comparator of type character. I told Java we're dealing with characters, it was able to infer that from the rest of the code. <coughs> So what's going on here is that char isn't a character, and we gave Java flat out too much to do. This does suggest a workaround that doesn't involve a local variable. 
I can tell Java when I'm calling mapping that I have a string, and that's enough to save the situation. Once I've told it that, Java can infer that s.char at zero is a string method, which is not surprising. And since it knows it's a string method that returns a character, it knows that comparator.natural order should be comparing characters, and all is well with the world. So we have two techniques we can use here. One is to use a local variable. The other is to use a type on our lambda. Either of those approaches will give us sane input, and this is good. Our monkey has moved on from core Java and is now learning about URLs. He heard that there's this thing called the cloud, which is really exciting because he can deploy his code there and not have to talk to anyone in infrastructure. He is all gung-ho about this. He's using his basic Java knowledge, and he's comparing two URLs to check that they're equal. This seems perfectly fine. It does output true. Everything is good. He tries it again with his cloud URL, and it's false. Like, those are the same URL. They are, until they aren't. What's going on here is that the DNS alias for cloud APIs can change on you. If it changes between your two calls, or well, before equals runs rather, you no longer have the same quality as you did in the first place. So you may think you have the same URL, but it's moved. Very confusing, I know. I got to look up about this, and it turns out that the URL equal method calls URL stream handlers equal method, which uses DNS re resolution, which sees that the cloud URL has changed and then returns false. The lesson here is that you're supposed to use URI when you're comparing URLs and not URL. If you do that, it looks at what the alias is rather than its resolution, and you no longer have this problem. Scary stuff. Can't rely on equals anymore. There's a nice article about this topic if you want to read more about it. I'll pause for anyone who wishes to take a photo of the screen. Or you can just look at my speaker deck later, which has all of these URLs in it. Happy 2020! Anybody work in December? Yeah. Or in January if you were doing reporting on December, which is how this happened to me. It's reasonable that you might want to write some code about weeks of the year. I did some reporting on things that happened for each of the 52-ish weeks of the year in 2019, and it didn't work quite the way I expected it to. Our first example is Christmas Eve. We want to know what week of the year Christmas Eve was. Christmas Eve was towards the end of the month, but not the very, very, very end of the month. And we used two APIs calls to do it. The first one is week of week based here, and the second one is week of year. These might sound exactly the same to you, and for good reason, because they both output 52 towards the end of the year, but not quite the end of the year. That means for most of the year, these APIs are similar to each other. But, of course, this is a talk on surprises. So sometimes they are not the same. We have another example here on New Year's Eve. When I run the same exact code for New Year's Eve, I get 1 and 53. Those are not the same. When I ran it, of course, I got one. I was in a hurry, so I solved the problem by saying, if December and result equal one, it's 53. I then went home, thought about it, and the next morning fixed my code to something that was a bit more reasonable. But I got my report out on time, so I call that a victory. So what's going on here? First of all, most years are 52 weeks and one day in length. That's perfect for programmers. We like off by one errors. There's no way that could possibly go wrong. 2020 happens to have started on a Wednesday. When you use a week-based week, it starts on the Sunday before January 1st. Since 2020 started on a Wednesday, the week-based week for 2020 started on December 20-something, which meant that De December 31st was in the first week of the year. Whereas the week method turns a number between 1 and 44. 54 because it uses January 1st as the date and because of the way calendars work your week could end at different periods of time So we've got another example with weeks of the year, which probably isn't surprising how this is gonna go Christmas we're going to output the year YYY MMDD we made sure to use a capital M So we're printing the month and not the minute and it outputs December 24th 2019 Good just like we told it to and it did it using both of our patterns, whether we use lowercase y or uppercase y. 
You might be wondering why there's two. And guess what? It's for December 31st. We run it again, and this time, the first one tells us that it is 2019, 1231, which is good because that's what it is. And when we use the capital Y, it tells us that it's a year later. We've got our same problem of when exactly does the year end. So the lesson here is use lowercase y's and not uppercase y's when you're doing your years because you really don't want your report to be inaccurate. I know a lot of us work for financial institutions. They're not fond of transactions that are a year in the future. Okay, so we've got Y is the year. Y, capital Y, is the week of the year. And be careful with your week of the year. Before we close this presentation, we have to close our resources. All right, my favorite resources are JDBC. I don't do JDBC as often anymore, but I still like it. With, like, with the most recent versions of Java, Java 11, I think, had it maybe Java 10, you can declare your resources outside a try with cache block, and as long as they're effectively final, you can use them in your try with resources, and they'll get automatically closed for you. This is great. It allows you to make your code shorter by not having to cram so much into a try with resource. It also introduces the opportunity for problems. In this example, I have a contrived prepared statement that has no parameters, and I use it. Try with resources runs. At the end of the try with resources, try with resources calls statement.close for me, and this code works. It's not good code. You should not write code like this, but it does work, and it does close my resource, which is the point of this example. So it, it's good by some definition of good. Now we have a slightly better prepared statement that actually has a bind variable in it. So I've got the same thing with a different SQL statement, but this time I called statement.setString. Cool. This one is not good. Does anyone know why this one is not good? Spoiler, we're in the try with resource section about closing resources. Is there anything that could possibly go wrong? Set string should be inside the try block. Set string should be in tri inside the try block, and that would actually solve this problem. That is true. The problem we have here is we actually have a potential resource leak, even though we took the time to use try with resources. And the reason we have that is if set string fails. If set string fails, try with resources is never entered. And if try with resources is never entered, it does not automatically close your statement for you, and now you have a resource leak. Um, we got a correct answer there that if we put statement set string inside the try with resources, we would not have this problem, and that would be an improvement. Will this be a warning or an error? It will be neither. Um, the code compiles. There's no warning because there's nothing wrong with it from the compiler's point of view. You can put statements wherever you want. It will appear to run, or it will crash if you did it incorrectly, but nothing is going to be like, hey, look at me, I'm a resource leak. Right? You find that out in production under load. Far less convenient. So we have what's going on here is that the try with resources doesn't close our resource, which is its whole purpose for being. <coughs> Poor try with resources. Next up, we have something similar with I.O. If we were writing code the long way. We could create a buffered reader inside a try with resources. We could loop through each line, collect our lines, and do something with all of those lines. This code does work. This code does not have a resource leak, which is good. We're in a section about resource leaks. Not having a resource leak is something that's a nice feature of that language. But this code is really verbose, and we're supposed to be using streams right now. And I know that if all I want to do is count the lines in the file, I could write it in one line. Except we have a problem. Does anyone know what the problem is? Spoiler, we're in a section on resource leaks. Yep, this nice simple code has a resource leak. The problem is that the terminal operation count does not close our stream. So every time we call files.lines, it opens our file, and we never actually close our file, and that's bad. That's why we're supposed to be using try with resources. It affects a handful of APIs on files, find, lines, list, new directory stream, and walk. 
You probably use some of these methods less than others, but all of them are subjects of the problem. And the fix is yucky. The fix is that you have to use a try with resources block by hand, create your own stream, and then call all the intermediate and terminal operations inside of it. It's hard to remember to do this. It's not elegant. We're using streams to get away from code that looks like this, and it's back. The good thing is linters like sonar lint will flag this scenario. At least you don't find out about it in production under load when your code is crashing. So that's progress, I suppose. To tie things up, there are a number of free tools that can help you with some problems, but not all of them. In fact, the resource leak ones are the most useful ones in this presentation that they can find. But they can help you with a lot of other things, like unused code, or um, not having a return in your finally, or race conditions, or stuff like that. So you definitely want to be using at least one of these tools in your own code. <coughs> finally, I wanted to see if anyone had any favorite surprising behavior that they would like to share with the group. Okay. Those were mine. Some of them were things I stumbled upon at work, some of them were things I stumbled upon creating simple examples from the book, and some of them came from my friends. Mm -hmm.